Later on, with an expanded psyche, the different world religions with their various hues and terms and rhythms seem to be but different accents and changing emphases in exoteric modes of the one free and imminent life, sometimes called God. God is one. Life, which comprises the birth and death of bodies and egos, is also one. Only expressions and dialects vary in their beautiful differences. Why should we quarrel on our way home because our prejudices are not the same? I was wearied by exoteric dogmas, theological disputes, and mental subtleties. Wordiness and assertions soon became tiresome, and only silence seemed completely clear and satisfying. I realized that this silence was the esoteric heart of all religions. If religion was to be experienced rather than argued, dissected, analyzed, or even explained, the test of a person's faith was not what they professed to believe, but rather how they lived. Personally, I felt no need of ritual, imagery, magic, or even a language of symbols. The mystic silence was the satisfying medium, the silence of desire and thought. In the freedom of solitude, God was clearly imminent. God simply was and contented me unhidden by ideas, unblurred by words. I did not think of or to God. All was real and simple, and in this mystic clarity, there was no trying to explain or to understand the mystery of being and of becoming. The strange but utterly harmonious urges to live and to die in that childhood unitive mode of experiencing God, the one life was aware as comprising all the changing forms. In that mode of being, there were no problems, no questions, no fears, as these only pertain to the egos. No wonder that with such true memory, I resented the narrow, dogmatic, and didactic preaching of the holy priest who tried to bully me into his faith. He had the language of the letter, but not that of the living silence. This priest had the outer authority, the learning, the office, and the force of willfulness, but the local farmers around did not seem impressed by the spirit of his living. His violent tempers and intolerant criticisms might well have been relieved and released by simple understanding and living acceptance. Against this well-meaning flaming pillar of faith, the Viking boy was thrust at the age of 14, and the impact had blessed results though the encounter itself was a painful rather than pleasant one. That compulsory bullying caused this young lad to revolt. He had to think, and the whole fabric of dogmas and churchianity began to unravel. If I successfully loosened a knot at one place, there was sure to be a tangle elsewhere. I seemed unable to be taught unable to accept livingly as faith for myself what was merely told and asserted from outside. Such mode and such language might be true and right for others, but was not felt to be mine. The effort that would be required to either understand matters of faith or to impress others with my outward show of learning never seemed important to me. What mattered most was the kingdom here and now, the mystic death into life. 
I remember responding to this holy priest by thinking to myself, Know ye not that ye must be born? The ear of corn, unless it falls unto the earth and dies, cannot live. Thou fool, that which you soweth is not quickened unless it dies. I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. But the priest's explanations and comments bewildered me, and perhaps it showed, for he would pounce especially on me. I had to explain meaning, and he would often choose me to repeat his explanations. I muttered and fluttered and stuttered, having no word language in which I could suggest to my tormentor that our ego consciousness hides our self-awareness and that we must first wake up from the deathly sleep of ignorance, a false self-identification, before we can quicken into steady living awareness. Unfortunately, the priest Gudmi's stem bullying in his loud fossil wordiness soon shut me up, and his interpretations prevailed as the truth. He thundered hell fire at me when I quoted, Seek ye the kingdom within. Within what? he bellowed. Shakingly but unsubdued, I suggested. Within all things. But he was quite sure the devil was within me, prompting me to express such wicked pantheistic notions. He preached and bullied like any dictator but not at all subtly and suavely like a Jesuit. Although I resented it at the time, I now have come to see his sternness and willfulness as a blessing. Even if his hellfire did not convince me of his doctrines and dogma, he did confirm me in my own faith. At that time, I had no word language for this faith. But somehow I knew that my God was very still, positive, imminent, and somehow akin to feeling, good and rich and vast in harmony of the unbroken perfection. No words, no names, and no trying were required when I was alone. And there was rarely any need either to express or to reveal myself in words to others. But fellow pilgrims would assert and explain noisily in confusing names and terms. God was certainly in my beloved trees, in the farm animals, in the fields, and in the changing moods of nature perhaps even more whole and dignified in these non-human friends. It was only my human friends who would try to fill me with their explanations, their analyses, and their advice on how I could progress. My God could be silent in seven languages and could be still in being, as well as busy doing things. The term God more than sufficed when I was richly alone in the all. I also found that it sufficed when talking to others. It was conveniently vague and short and ambiguous, and it meant to each individual exactly what they wanted it to mean, as long as they didn't ask me to explain myself. Each to his own Christ, as they say, On the universal path, each of us has their own dharma, their own true rhythm, and their most appropriate speed. Our task is to find our own path within ourselves and not try to push others onto it, but to let them be true to their own path. To thine own self be true. True charity often requires leaving another person alone. What folly and falseness and vanity in our assertiveness and our trying to share. What an imposition. What conceit of agency. Such so-called giving 
is often nothing more than clever ego strutting, pretending to be spiritual and losing contact with the spiritual dimension, all in a vain exhibitionism and in pushy idealism and antics.